Okay, in this part, let's look at um, batch descent, which is a recently proposed denoising method uh, that we presented in Europe's. This is joint work with Joshua and LF Barriers. So before getting into uh, what the method is, how it works, here are some issues that uh, we addressed with batch to self. First and foremost, we take care that batch to self does not suppress signal. It only uh, manages to suppress random additive noise. Um, it can be applied at any point of the preprocessing pipeline in the sense that we do not make um, a hard requirement that it has to be the first step that has to be applied on raw raw data. Um, it works pretty much with any type of data that is a diffusion acquisition, and it is a single subject denoiser. It is fast, it is low memory, um, we employ matrix sketching, which you will learn about in the next part. Um, it's beyond just pretty pictures, right? Because in diffusion MRR, we don't care about how the how it looks visually as much as how it affects downstream tasks. So um, in the part after this one, I will explain how we can ev evaluate model fitting uncertainty and gauge the effect of how denoising performs on group analyses. And uh, lastly, it's a generic denoiser. It works even beyond diffusion MRN. Uh, just as a note, it does not employ deep learning. It is a simple single subject linear regression based machine learning method. So basically, diffusion MRI is limited in SNR, as I explained before. Um, the sources of noise vary. Um, it, is, it depends on the type of acquisition that you have. Here, I'm showing a single cell acquisition that's a PPMI, standard DTI, DTI protocol. Here's a Hardy protocol, and here's a multi-shell, more HCP style acquisition. And what happens is when your data is inherently noisy, no matter what model you, model you fit to the data, it is going to be pushed away from reality. So for example, here you hope to acquire this blue line, but because of noise, you end up acquiring something that's not about that. And when you make an approximation in the model space, let's say you wanted to acquire this orange line, what you end up getting is a dotted yellow line. It's a toy representation, just trying to show that uh, the noise affects the model fitting and model fitting in, her, uh, in turn affects the tractography, right? So uh, here is the optic radiation bundle. Um, the blue streamlines are the ones that are true positives or other coherent streamlines that we want to extract, but because of inherent noise, uh, which first affects microstructure and then affects uh, tractography, you see that you start pulling in some yellowish red lines that are incoherent and that are artifacts due to noise. So in order to suppress noise, we build a denoiser that uses the statistical independence of noise, right? As opposed to previous methods, which are famous in diffusion MRI, um, they use one of three approaches. One is that it could be low rank. That is what is done in BCA. Um, if you had to do non-local means, um, it is trying to use that uh, use the fact that the signal is repetitive all over the image. And uh, if you had to use the total variation norm, you would assume that the signal is locally glo globally smooth. Whereas in Pasha self, we switch this assumption. So instead of making an assumption on the signal, we are making an assumption on the noise. So I'm showing three gradient directions over here, right? Uh, these are all independently acquired, and we, we can make use of the fact that noise in one gradient direction is independent of the noise in other gradient directions. So how noise is randomly fluctuating in G1 would be independent of how noise is randomly fluctuating in G2, and so on. So using this fact, we will train a self-supervised regression model. Um, the idea is that since we know that noise is statistically independent across gradient directions, we can train a separate denoiser to, um, to denoise each volume iteratively. Right? And the idea is that since noise is uncorrelated or randomly fluctuating, the regression model will not be able to learn that. It will end up learning only the true signal. Right? Uh, so the key takeaway is that we train one separate regressor to denoise each volume. So how that works is first, we extract 3D patches from all N volumes of the data. So let's say this is the 4D diffusion MRI uh, data where each orange box represents an independent gradient direction. We extract a 3D patch for each voxel in this uh, entire volume. And we do that for all volumes. And a 3D patch is nothing but um, a 3D neighborhood. It could be isotropic and isotropic however you, however you want. So for example, let's say this dark and gray voxel is the, um, is the voxel around which we want to extract the neighborhood, you get a patch radius and you extract it. Then we say that we will hold out one gradient direction, which we want to denoise. And using the rest of the n minus one gradient directions, we will just predict this one. And to do so, we only predict the center voxel of the corresponding patches from, uh, from the target volume, right? And this uh, regression is a self-supervised loss. So it is nothing but the mean squared error that is being minimized between the training set and the target volume that we want to denoise. 
uh, just to give you a deeper overview of what I just explained, let's say you had these um, n grade interactions, you extract 3D patches from all over the data, and then you flatten these uh, 3D patches out. So uh, the P neighborhoods that I call them, essentially the 3D patches of all these gradient interactions are flattened into one large 2D matrix. Along the rows, you will have all the voxels in a particular gradient interaction, and along the columns, you will have the gradient interactions. So uh, let's say you wanted to denoise one particular volume, you would have that as your regression target. Um, so for example, if you had 1 million rows, this would be 1 million rows. And if you had, uh, let's say, 65 grade interactions, then these would be 64 and this would be 1, right? And we just train this regression model like you do in standard linear regression, and you predict only the center voxel once the model is trained, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what you end up getting is the denoised volume. So just as a quick note, uh, the model that, uh, sorry, the volume that we want to denoise, rather the gradient direction that we want to denoise, is only used as a target. It is not a part of the design matrix. Um, initially, we started out with nonlinear regression function, uh, essentially a support vector regression, a convolutional neural network, a multi-layer perceptron. But what ended up working the best was a linear regression. And there is actually a deeper Q-space interpretation that we can make of this, right? So what the patch to self approach is essentially doing is saying that let's take one gradient direction, which is represented in Q-space over here. Um, let's predict that gradient direction as a combination of the remaining gradient directions. So essentially, when you use a linear regression, this gradient direction is being represented as a linear combination of the remaining gradient directions. And um, it actually turns out that minimizing this loss, essentially predicting one as a combination of others, which is called J-invariant regression, which we'll look at in the next slides, actually minimizes the ground truth loss and the noise variance. So in itself, like the process of you know holding this out, predicting that held out volume iteratively for all volumes is inherently doing a denoising. So how does this J-invariance work, right? So let's say you had your data, let's call it X. And let's say Y is your noisy label. So let's say you had um, six grade interactions. You put, put out one of those six grade interactions. Let's say um, this was one, and this was five remaining grade interactions, right? And let's say you had the ground truth data. Let's call it Z. Um, then if you if you just minimize f of x minus y, which is essentially uh, the this is the regression model that you want to train. Y was your noisy label. X was just uh, just the five images that we used for training. Um, if you just add a like do the standard math of adding and subtracting so that you don't change this equation and expand it out, you realize that this is nothing but uh, expansion of f of x minus z the whole square, z minus y the whole square, and this. So the first term, if you pay attention over here, is in, uh, minimizing the ground truth loss, essentially taking f, uh, f of x, which is our prediction, z was the ground truth image, and the second term is the uh, noise variance. So essentially, what is the difference between the ground truth image and the noisy label, right? And when you minimize this loss, you are essentially minimizing this entire expansion. Uh, this turns out to be zero because uh, you assume that noise is mean zero uh, in diffusion. That is not true, but since you're doing it like iteratively and you have a holdout procedure, as the self is designed that it can get rid of this noise. Uh, of course, there is a factor that um, there is compressibility. Say we are assuming that the gradient direction that we want to denoise can be represented as a linear combination, but that's the phenomenon we discovered. Right? And uh, in the slide, I'm essentially just uh, taking expectations of what we saw on the previous slide, showing that the math works out really well. Um, so expectation of this and expectation of uh, so ex expectation of ground truth loss minimization plus expectation of noise variance minimization. And this, uh, if you work out expectations, um, you will see that this goes to zero. And this is the final loss, the self-supervised loss that Pash self uses. So uh, let's look at a bit of the results. We use some simulator data. Um, the data was simulated by adding Gaussian noise to the real and imaginary part. Uh, we did that for SNR5 to 25. Um, it had, so on the first row is noisy data for each of them. So that is what we gave as input. We compared against uh, Martian pasture um, in the paper, if you see the supplement, there is also comparison against local PCA at different thresholds and non-local means. Um, and if you see at ground truth, uh, if you look at the ground truth and you see the partial self result, you see that even at SNR10, um, you start coming very close to ground truth. And just to visually evaluate this, we plotted the scatter plot, and you see that although there's some mean reversion, which is expected um, as SNR improves, 
you see that Pasha self is coming, is falling more along the identity line. Um, the orange one is Smashanka Pasha PCA and the red one is noisy data, right? And uh, on the y-axis, we have uh, the noise data on the x-axis that's ground truth. So essentially you see that the better the SNR, it starts coming closer and closer to the ground truth, but in any case, it's starting to do quite well. Uh, Pasha self does not suppress noise and um, it, more or less preserves anatomical detail. What that means is that you don't lose edge information, essential tissue information, which you want to preserve for doing downstream analysis, such as uh, microstructure modeling, tractography, and stuff like that, right? So there's no smoothing of the data. A standard way of evaluating this is by looking at the average residuals across gradient directions. And uh, you will see that even MPPCA or partial self, both of them do not really suppress the signal. You are really suppressing noise. Uh, the one that you see on top is the standard DTI protocol, 64 directions. The one in the middle is a Hardy protocol, which is 150 gradient directions. And uh, the one at the bottom is the Stanford, uh, is the Sherbrooke three shell protocol, which is a multi-shell acquisition. And I think it has B values up to 3000. Um, then when we look at tractography, you see that uh, the original data, which had a lot of false positives, like the yellowish red lines that you see uh, in the optic radiation bundle, they get re they reduce as the denoising result improves. There are some that are there due to marginal pasture PCA, but pasture itself they go away a little more. Um, then we also show that the signal prediction improves with downstream uh, with uh, the downstream signal prediction, essentially model fitting, improves with pasture self. Um, this is done using a cross validation approach that we have in DiPi. Uh, I picked out sample voxels, uh, the ones on the left column are from the corpus callosum, and the ones on the right are from the centrum semi -oval. And the teal colored dots are essentially past self. The red colored dots are original raw data, and the orange colored dots are uh, from much of past PCL. And to quantify this improvement across all voxels in the data, we uh, summarized it using box plots. Um, I forgot to mention that we use a constraint spherical deconvolution and the diffusion tensor model to do this evaluation. And the R squared, if you see, of the goodness of fit improves pretty much everywhere. Um, in the corpus callosum, I think the CSD is a better model. And I think in the centrum semi oval, uh, I think. In the centrum semi oval, I think the, uh, the CSD is a better model. And I think in the corpus callosum, the diffusion tensor. Maybe I got that wrong. Uh, anyway, so moving on. Uh, Pasture self can be applied on pretty much any type of data. It is not restricted to the human brain. Um, you can use it on cardiac data. The one that you see on top is a porcine heart, essentially a pig heart. Um, and you can see that uh, the noise that's suppressed is pretty much random. We don't suppress any structure. The one on the bottom is a T1 weighted um, spinal cord image. Uh, on the left, sorry. And uh, essentially, if you have a series of images, you can just put them into a self and it should work for you. Um, and the one on the bottom the left is the HCP70 data. And this is quite interesting because you see that there is a banded pattern that's suppressed. Um, so the HCP70 data that I gave as input to Pasture self was um, already pre-processed. So I'm not sure if this artifact is a high field imaging artifact or it is due to some pre-processing step um, that added this banded pattern. Um, but essentially you can get rid of even structured noise, which is uncorrelated across different gradient directions. And that brings me to one of the key points of why we developed Ash to Self is that you may have this type of data which is already pre-processed, right? You may have even used another denoiser. As long as it has not started correlating noise across gradient directions, you can still pass to self, you can still use Pasture Self and uh, salvage that data. Pasture self can be applied pretty much on any data, right? It's a generic denoiser. It is not restricted to diffusion and error. As long as you have a series data, you can use pasture self on it. So the one that you see on top is optical imaging data. Um, you can see that pretty much a lot of noise is suppressed. Here is the optic nerve, uh, which is through a novel instrumentation that we have at IU. And the one on the bottom is functional error. And you can see that it is also clearing up quite a bit of the time series, right? Uh, anyway, so enough of uh, explaining the method. Now let's look at the implementation. All right, there are two ways of implementing Pasture Self. Um, you can either use Pasture Self via the Pythonic API, that is via DiPy, and the other way is to use the command line interfaces that we provide within DiPy. Let's first look at the Pythonic API. 
Uh, these are some basic packages that you need uh, for plotting, for executing numerical op operations, loading and saving NFT files. Bash itself is loaded via this module, uh, which is in the denoise module of Typer. So here I first load the NFT file and the B value. Uh, Bash itself by default takes uh, requires only the data and the B values as necessary inputs, all other are optional inputs. Whenever you're dealing with your data, you want to set the shift intensity to true. Uh, this is just uh, a necessary precaution. Um, if you set the verbose flag to true, it will print an output something like this, which essentially shows a progress of uh, how the volumes are being denoised. If you have only one B0, then we skip denoising uh, the B0s, but if you have more than one, then bash itself will denoise B0s also. Um, next, we can, it also at the end shows the time, if you're interested. And next we show um, the output. So for example, you can use in the uh, diaper tutorial, we have this example of how to see the denoising performance. And this is your raw image. This is your denoised output. And you can see the residuals over here. Um, as you can see, none of the, the like the residuals do not have um, any signal components in them and does not really suppress signal. It's just basically noise. And uh, to look at the command line interface, uh, I would recommend first checking um, if DiPi is installed. So you need DiPi 1.4.1 and above to run Bash itself properly. So to see if uh, you have access to DiPi command lines, you can simply do pip to DiPi. And that should show you your DiPi version. Here you can see that I'm on the 1.5.0, which is the dev version, but uh, anything above 1.4.0 should have DiPi. Next, to see, uh, to run Bash yourself using DiPi, you need to run. So this is a command that you need to run and using hyphen H will give you all the options that are there within Bash to self on the command line. So you can see we have the word boost flag, the uh, model, which basically takes uh, one of these three, the OLS ridge or lasso as input. You can also give any fit correct type of model as input as long as it uh, follows the cyclone convention. Um, so you can see that the necessary inputs are the input files and the BWAL files. This is your nifty and this is your BWAL file. And um, the others are optional. So just to make sure that it is running properly, um, let's quickly copy over the file parts. So I'm gonna take this exact thing. So we, the first file is the NFT file, and now we need to pass the PVAL file, which is this one. And that's it. And this should do the denoising for you. By default, um, the output is written in a uh, out denoised file. You can change that output file name by um, using the out dir command. So out dir space, uh, the file name that you want to save with. And if you want to use the word boost flag, you can do that too. So I just stop this over here. I just read on it with the word post flag. As you can see, the same thing has started where it shows the B0 denoising is skipped. And now it should start showing you um, the volumes as they are being denoised. Okay, that's it. Um, it's very simple to implement. If you have any issues, you can ask us on Gitter, you can raise an issue on GitHub, and even 